Why was central planning adopted by communist regimes like the Polish one after 1945? Well, first of all, <coughs> central planning was adopted in uh, Eastern Europe, meaning smaller countries in Eastern Europe, for, for a very simple fact that those countries became dominated by Soviet Union and they had to tow the Soviet line. And that meant that they had to imitate the system they established there, meaning central planning. It wasn't adopted for idealistic reasons then? Well, there may have been some communists, a tiny minority as communists were, and maybe a minority of that minority, who believed in a pre phoenician economy without money. That is uh, <coughs> one of ways uh, to describe central planning. But uh, <coughs> that was, I think, secondary to the main reason why central planning was established here and elsewhere. Have these centrally planned economies been successful? No, I think they have been a failure throughout. Only at different times uh, centrally planned economies uh, were showing <coughs> either somewhat better or somewhat worse results. But generally, <coughs> they were much less successful than Western market-type economies. What is the basic reason for that? There are at least three basic reasons of uh, <coughs> failure of centrally planned economies. First of all, it is that the usual test of the market has been superseded by commands. And if you <coughs> command enterprise to produce something, it means that uh, enterprise uh, managers and workers' rewards depend not really on what they do, but depend on what they report. And that means that they don't need, in, in <coughs> extreme case, to produce anything at all. They could just put up good reports. In reality, that means that they can produce any shot the good they can think of, and probably less than they report. This is what <coughs> took the name of imaginative reporting here in this part of the world. So the reports are not accurate? Definitely, reports are overstated. There are many <coughs> studies that show uh, that economic growth rates in Eastern Europe have been grossly overstated. In some countries more, like in uh, East Germany or Romania, in some countries less, like in Czechoslovakia, uh, and least in Hungary. They have the most accurate statistics and have them throughout, even from the very beginning. But nonetheless, they were all overstated. But, but hasn't East Germany been successful as a centrally planned economy? I think that East Germany hasn't been more successful than any other East European country. Actually, I think that East Germany and Czechoslovakia were the greatest failures. You have to remember that those were very highly advanced industrial economies before the Second World War. And after the war, they were losing the distance decade by decade to the industrial West. To compare the two Germanies, so to say, Federal Republic and East Germany. Uh, the, before the war, the economic level of pre the present East Germany was something like 98% in 1936, if I remember well. Then in the late 40s, it was already 83% or something, according to another study. In 1967, there was a study done in West Berlin, it showed that that level is 78%. And there are now various studies that show it's about 50%. So it is, in terms of uh, competition of countries or <coughs> territories with the same population, ethnic population, with uh, the same level of industrial development, uh, they are a clear and unequivocal failure. They might be better off than Poland or Bulgaria or, or, or Soviet Union, but, it, but that is not due to the fact that they are better centrally planned economy. They are due to the fact that they used to be a better, more industrialized market economy until 45, and this is their sole advantage. Can I just ask you to repeat part of that question and just say that uh, East Germany compared to West Germany 
had, uh, East Germany was 98% mm -hmm. at the level of West Germany, then it fell to what the figures were, just to make the con contrast very simple, if you could just say mm -hmm. that a little bit again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, comparing uh, <coughs> East Germany with the Federal Republic, you could see that before the war, the levels of uh, economic development was about the same, it was 98% of the present West German territories level. On the other hand, it was much less in 48. It was still less in 1967, some 70 something percent. And it is now about 50% according to various studies. So they are clearly falling behind. How reliable are the economic statistics in communist Europe generally? Well, <coughs> Hungarian writer once wrote that uh, <coughs> economic statistics are like a bikini swimsuit. They can reveal a lot, but on the other hand they have to cover the gist of the matter because otherwise the scandal would be too great. And uh, this was written by a Hungarian writer and Hungary has the best statistics in Eastern Europe. So the other should be seen in <laughs> in a, a relation to that, which means that they are much worse. Hungarian statistics are actually not much worse than average Western statistics. But East German statistics, Romanian statistics are very bad. Polish, Russian are also bad. Czech are somewhat better. But none of them are real, uh, reliable enough to, to use them straight for East-West comparison. Could you give an example of a study done to show how unreliable these statistics are? One of the examples of the, <coughs> of the unreliability of those statistics could be taken from the United Nations study of the level of income and growth rates of income in both West and East. And it showed, for example, the average overstatement of economic growth rate throughout the 50s, 60s and early 70s was something like two percentage points. So like when for example, economic growth rate was reported to be 5%, so it was in reality, according to that study, which still overstated the case in my view, some 3%. And uh, East Germany was at the top of the overstatements. In some periods, for example, overstatements were as far, uh, as high as uh, 8 percentage point. It was in the early 50s during the so-called economic miracle in West Germany. And then East Germans, they, ha they had to show that they have even better miracle because this is a communist miracle. So they added so much to the official growth rate that the overestimate <coughs> was something like 8.5 percentage point per annum during the 1950-1955 period, according to that study. Well, there are other studies who show that show uh, <coughs> in uh, uh, similar light the East German and other statistics. The statistics for 1975-1982 periods, American, an American study, they show, for example, that it was something like 50% of the growth rate was overstated. And in Bulgaria, for example, for the same period it was 75% overstated. Throughout Eastern Europe we have we hear about reforms, economic reforms. After the martial law period in Poland, the economic reforms were discussed and are supposedly being introduced. What are these reforms? Economic reforms are seen in Eastern Europe nowadays as a way out of economic decline that is visible everywhere, from relatively more successful to relatively less successful um, East European economies. It was also <coughs> introduced in a very, uh, li to, the, to a very limited extent in Poland uh, in 1982, but unfortunately it was much less than was discussed in 1981 during the relative freedom, during the solidarity period. But even those reforms discussed in 1981 were not sufficient to give economy a momentum to move toward a, a really efficient market type economy. So what sort of reforms were they? Mostly, I would say, cosmetic. Uh, abolishing commands, for example, in most cases, not in all even. 
but on the other hand keeping rationing intact so that they could always not command but suggest enterprise to produce what the bureaucrats wanted because otherwise it was obvious that they wouldn't get the materials that are as usual under central planning in short supply. What are the Polish economic reforms and what's wrong with them? Polish economic reforms are simply very timid. They don't go far enough in the market direction. Some of the features of central planning have been abolished, like uh, <coughs> commands, in most cases, not in all even. But on the other hand, rationing has been retained, and this is the way to force enterprises to work according to plan as before as in the past, because under the conditions of general uh, shortages of materials, labor and so on, if they don't get materials, that means that they won't be able to pursue the most profitable option. So retaining uh, rationing and uh, abolishing commands is quasi-reform, not a reform as such. And secondly, there is a very important point of the autonomy of enterprises. This is probably one of the reasons why central planning it cannot work at all <coughs> under such conditions, actually under any conditions, because once you nationalize enterprises, there is nobody who is interested in pursuing <coughs> the profit. Actually, everybody is interested in <coughs> in uh, obeying commands or, as in the case of so-called reformed East European economies, obeying suggestions. And uh, under condi the conditions when managers are appointed through one or another procedure by the superior bodies, the ministries or what not, it means that they are following suggestions rather than profitable options. And, of course, if they uh, don't follow those suggestions, they lose their jobs. This is one thing. And another is that if they follow suggestions, that means that they are not uh, going after profitable options. And as a result, they usually incur various losses and then come back, cap in hand, to those who give recommendations and suggestions and ask for various subsidies. So the problem is unsolvable without enterprises that are completely autonomous and depend only on the owners. In this case, when it were uh, owners disappeared long ago or they were known because they were the enterprises were created already uh, after the communist rule, it means that th that they would uh, uh, have to be the workers. Self worker self management. Yeah, this is not the best solution, but under such circumstances, it is probably the only solution with those large enterprises that simply could not be bought by private entrepreneurs. It's obvious that private enterprise is better both in uh, uh, more quickly eliminating errors. And it is also much better in pursuing avenues of success. But uh, when it comes to self-managing enterprise, it's at least better in eliminating errors than state-owned enterprise. No one can want an economic system that doesn't work, surely. So who is stopping the more market-orientated real reforms happening? Yeah. I am often asked by Western <coughs> visitors, scholars, politicians, <coughs> casual observers who visit Poland, why it is so that the system that is obviously inefficient is still kept in place. Everybody would like to have a good economy, even the dictator. And uh, the answer is that uh, there is a lot of people who benefit from the badly functioning economy of that type. And uh, in any kind of undemocratic regime, in what I would call ordinary dictatorship. Uh, you would have a, a stratum that benefits from that, but in a way that is normal, let's say in Latin America or elsewhere. That is, uh, they get higher wages, they get perquisites, 
related to their positions in the government. But this all is all taken after the wealth is created. On the other hand, in this system we live in, situation is such that on top of this type of benefits, part of the ruling stratum uh, in, in, in the Soviet type uh, system benefits also from interfering in various ways in the functioning of the system itself. The most uh, important part of it is the system of nomenclatura, that is the right of the party to appoint everybody uh, uh, to uh, better paid managerial positions in uh, <coughs> public administration and first of all in the economy. This is probably the, 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 the <coughs> cue to, to, to the failure of the system. You cannot really expect that those people who are nominated on the basis of loyalty to uh, follow the most profitable option on the of the enterprise, for the, for the enterprise uh, as a whole. They will always be looking to those above them who nominated them uh, as, uh, as managers to follow their suggestions. And that's why it is so difficult to eradicate a common ill of all East European economies, the so-called soft constraint on enterprise. That is that they always can get the money one way or another to cover the losses. And since, since it is a, ro a rotating position in, the, uh, <coughs> in those enterprises, that means that they have to help them, first of all, because otherwise they wouldn't follow their recommendations next time, and secondly, because the, the role may be reversed in a year. The bureaucrats or party apparatchik can uh, be uh, appointed enterprise manager, and enterprise manager can go to the party apparatus. So they are working all in the family. 90% of managers in Poland now, just as it was in the year period, are party members. And that means that the pool of talents is smaller, the average quality of, of the talent is lower because of the well-known feature of the uh, negative selection under totalitarianism. <coughs> so you can't expect much. And thirdly, they don't pursue uh, monetized goals as in the normal economy. They are pursuing various goals, you, call, you may name them, uh, earning hard currency, saving energy, doing this, in decreasing labor input, but uh, in each case, they are unspecified in monetary terms. And that means that they come into conflict with the profitability of the enterprise. And that's the source of most losses. What also happens to a lot of the goods that are produced in these systems? I mentioned nomenclatura as one way of benefiting from the inefficient economy. <coughs> in nomenclatura, you have now 250,000 uh, managerial positions covered by the nomenclatura during the Jaruzelski period. Interestingly, it was only 100,000 such positions during the Gierek era. But there is also another way <coughs> through which the <coughs> ruling stratum in this uh, system benefits from it. It is through the reverse flow of goods coming from those enterprises managed by those managers appointed by the nomenclatura. So it is various goods and services that are being offered, that are in short supply, that are being offered to the higher level bureaucrats and uh, to the politicians at all level. And they are very, is very substantial in numbers. I uh, heard at one, uh, at one conference that it is about 40% of cars that are sold on the domestic market are allocated through the rationing system within that uh, nomenclatura. <laughs> well, I mentioned insufficient and uh, often superficial measures undertaken during the economic reforms after the martial law, but uh, there are other accompanying phenomena that also cast a shadow upon the intentions of the, of the ruling stratum as far as real economic reforms are concerned. 
<clears throat> I mentioned nomenclatura issue in different contexts, but it would be interesting to know that uh, there were about 100,000 managerial posts in economy and public administration covered by the communist nomenclatura during the late Gierek era. But under Jaruzelski, the number of those posts increased 150 percent to 250,000. And that, of course, means that there are less competent people and those <coughs> nominated not on the basis of their competence, but on the basis of loyalty is throughout the economy. And that must affect performance as well. What happened to the nomenclatura under the so-called reforms? After the martial law, the number of posts covered by nomenclatura increased sharply from about 100,000 uh, before to 250,000, which of course casts a shadow upon the real intentions of uh, reforms uh, by the authorities. If they increase the number of posts uh, uh, filled on the basis of loyalty rather than competence. This is one way of uh, saying that things got worse. Another way of saying is by an example of uh, allocation of scarce goods. I heard that in 1983 about 40% of cars that went to the domestic market were rationed through the uh, nomenclatura system for the faithful rather than through the market. And this is only one example. There are many other examples. For example, in Kraków region, it was revealed in the Economic Weekly that about 45% of household consumer durables, refrigerators, sewing machines, uh, and other goods of that sort, was allocated on a similar basis, that is, outside the regular retail trade channels. What are some of the consequences of the poor economics of communist Europe? pollution? There are many side effects of uh, not only bad economic performance, but of the economic system in which uh, goals are outlined in uh, numerical terms as planned figures to produce something. One of them is pollution. Usually, pollution is assumed to be associated with the level of industrial development. But here you have a completely different situation, that is the level of industrial development is much lower than in the West, but, but pollution is very much higher. I would take an example of uh, East Germany and the Federal Republic, where in East Germany the level of sulfur dioxide pollution is about four times higher than in the West Germany, in spite of the fact that the level of industrial development is obviously lower. Also an example of mineral water I'd like you to give us. There are many <coughs> other examples of various harmful uh, pollutants found in the air and uh, uh, in the water and in soil. I think uh, a dramatic uh, case is one of uh, health resorts. In Poland, for example, in some health, resor some health resorts are so polluted that uh, various, uh, <coughs> various minerals uh, are found also in mineral water, that is the water that people drink to cure themselves. In Krynica, one of them, the level of lead is so high that it is already dangerous to one's health to drink mineral water, except one that is a deep, uh, deep water. But all other, uh, all other uh, kinds of, of mineral waters are, are already harmful to one's health. Are there also psychological as well as, as, well as physical um, pollutants in East Communist Europe? Certainly the stress of life in uh, Eastern Europe, or generally stress of living under the communist system, is uh, very high. And it has manifold effects, one of them being increased mortality, especially among men, that is those who take the largest part in any kind of uh, social or political activity. And uh, this mortality has been 
higher here than elsewhere, but also it has been increasing over time. In the period, for example, between 1960 and 1980, mortality among men uh, of 19, of, of pardon, the mortality among men of 35 to 65 uh, years of age is, uh, uh, has increased by some 25% in Hungary, by some 20% in Czechoslovakia, some 50, 15% in Poland and Bulgaria, while in Western countries it generally declined, the largest decline being registered in Switzerland, for example. Can you give a specific example of stress in Romania? What causes stress? The sort of things that cause stress? Probably the most stressful situation nowadays is uh, that in Romania, where there is a lot of harassment of the population by various uh, watchmen groups who uh, control whether people don't ho hoard uh, more food than authorities regard as necessary, or they come and uh, tear down uh, the, <coughs> the light contacts in order to uh, be sure that they won't use more than one lamp per apartment. And there are many other things of that sort that make life there miserable. Well, you could also take the plain physical exhaustion as uh, one of the factors resultant from the fact that they live in apartments that are ill uh, heated or not heated at all, with temperature in winter falling to about 4 degrees centigrade, and uh, <coughs> they also often live in unlit apartment, apartments for, e for, for, for hours a day. How do you think communist Europe is going to be reformed? Are communist regimes like the Polish one going to move towards democracy as quickly? I mentioned the reforms uh, that they are unsatisfactory, timid, and actually blocked by those who benefit from the existence of the present inefficient economic system. And I don't think that under the political conditions of the communist system it is easy or quick to move from what we have now toward democracy. I envisage somewhat different route, which I still regard as something that is better than what we have now. I think that the first stage would be something like an ordinary autocracy, when there is still a ruling elite, the police, the military, and so on. But on the other hand, there are areas of autonomy, economy, <coughs> education, science, culture, and given that autonomy, things might get moving. But uh, moving from the present situation to the democracy would mean that those at the top, the ruling stratum, would actually lose everything because they are uncompetitive. So I think that they may give up something because they see that situation is deteriorating also for them, not only for us. And as a result, they may give up the control of the totalitarian type over the economy, allow the economy to be run along the normal market uh, lines, and with the overall increasing welfare of the population and their own welfare, they may at some point see that keeping political control is very tiring in the flexible, moving society and the economy. And then they may regard that it is simply not worth the bother. So then probably in some 10 years, 20 years time, we may think of moving from the Franco type uh, ordinary dictatorship to the democracy. But right now, really, our hope is to move from the totalitarian dictatorship to the ordinary dictatorship.